I'm Benjamin Hall, and I'm Searching for Heroes. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I've got such a great guest on today. He's, um, he's like family to me. Uh, it's Trey Yingst, who's a great colleague. He's a great friend. Uh, and he's leading all our coverage out there in uh, Israel at the moment. But, you know, Trey was alongside me and our team in Ukraine when we were hit. He was there when that attack happened. And today, you know, we're going to talk about what we usually talk about, which is resilience and strength, but also how it is for him to cover conflict, what it was like uh, in Ukraine, you know, after that attack and where he finds the strength to do what he does. This is it was such a great pleasure to have him on today. And I will also say, if you haven't read his book, Black Saturday, which is all about October the 7th, how he reacted, how the team reacted and how they covered it, go and read it. It's an excellent book. But thanks for joining me again today. And here's me and Trey. I think that the place to start is what you're doing at the moment and the things that you're seeing and how difficult that is and how you try and find a place for yourself uh, within the reporting that takes you out of the story, even though you're right in the middle of it. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we're still in the middle of a big story that really hasn't peaked yet in many ways. The war started over a year ago with the October 7th massacre, and it's been ongoing ever since in many different forms. And it really started with a ground operation into Gaza. And our focus was reporting from southern Israel in the immediate aftermath of the massacre and then following this ground operation inside, going with the Israeli army toward the front lines. And then also covering really the human toll that this war took on both the Israeli people and the Palestinian people. And so that was our focus for months. And just recently, over the past several months, we shifted our coverage up to northern Israel, reporting from the third largest city of Haifa, and then going into southern Lebanon with the Israeli army. And I think there are many similar aspects to that coverage, as we saw with Gaza, but some things are different. Um, so I, th I think that there's many similarities and, and, and many differences. But when we look at the situation on the ground, we try to dive in as much as we can to the human impact and, and the people that are affected by this conflict. And what's interesting, and you've experienced this many times around the world, is that eventually people stop caring. They go back to their normal lives in the United States or wherever they're tuning in from. And there's only so much war coverage that they care to listen to. And I think that that's a huge challenge as we cover these stories, I, trying to make people care about what's happening and trying to find fresh angles. I think that that's a, overall um, what's critical when we look at at our coverage, but also when we look at the, the angles that we try to find, to find fresh angles, to make people care about the coverage. And, you know, on, on a personal level, that can be challenging, but I also think on a, a professional level, it's challenging because you have to constantly be innovative in your approach to the craft and making people care about these stories. Yeah, it's interesting you say try and find a different perspective, and I, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, every story when you're seeing it in person feels very different, but on the news, uh, you know, X amount of rockets were fired from Gaza into Israel. And that story just, you know, how do you keep giving that different angles? Is it by telling the stories of the very people who are involved? Is that how you think you can give a story an edge just by going really personal on it? Yeah, I always try to take a more personal angle and try to find characters in a broader story that represent, I think, the, the average person on every side of a conflict. And I think it's really easy to get caught up in the numbers and talk about the rockets and the drone attacks and what's happening on the ground. And that's important context, but I don't think that it represents the human experience amid these stories. And yeah. so that's, that's challenging. It's interesting because you, know, you talk about the human experience. And I suppose one of the things that I do on this podcast is that I talk to people who have gone through really difficult things or people who have seen things that are really difficult, but then find strength on the other side. And I suppose you must have seen time and time again, people who have gone through the absolute worst. I mean, you, you see people on the worst days of their life with their whole family being torn apart. And so you must also see the loss, but you must sometimes see the strength. I mean, do, do you sometimes find that in some of these darkest places, you can actually see quite incredible moments of courage, bravery, strength? And how do you balance those two things side by side? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that we often come across people who are handling some of the most horrific experiences of their lives in a very graceful way, in a very generous way in a way that puts others first, despite the fact that they have nothing. And it's not just in the course of war coverage, but also in the course of disaster coverage and broader foreign policy. When we were in Morocco, for example, last year, covering the aftermath of the 6.8 magnitude earthquake that destroyed a lot of Marrakesh and many villages in the high Atlas Mountains, that's really what stood out to me most about that coverage, the generosity of the people who had literally lost everything. So their homes were completely destroyed. Their family members were still buried under the rubble, but yet they wanted to make sure that we had Mm -hmm. tea and bread because that's what they had. And we were in the middle of nowhere, deep in the high Atlas Mountains, but there was this moment of humanity, I think, that shined through. And I have seen that so often in conflict around the world, as you have, that people broadly don't want to be in the middle of war. They don't want to be in the middle of disaster. And so often they are forced to be there. And so the question is, how will they act under that pressure? How will they act whenever the odds are against them? And I think that broadly speaking, they tend to resort to basic human nature, which is helping others, helping their neighbor and being the best versions of themselves as they try to survive. Yeah, I remember, you know, so many times around the Middle East in particular, you go to, say, refugee camp, and you sit down in someone's tent, and they will give you the very last piece of food that they have. They will serve to you the only food that they had for their family because it's just part of their culture. And you always try and say no to it. You try and deny it. But they say it, it was more rude for you to say no and refuse that than it is to sit there and eat it alongside them. And I always found that amazing. And on, on the other side, though, Trey, you know, you, you've seen a lot of evil, hatred, anger, And I suppose, what do you think about when you think about some people have the courage and the strength you just talked about, and other people have this hatred and this anger on the other side? Like, what do you think about the two total extremes there and how those trickle down into society? That's a really interesting question. And I think that a lot of times people forget that even the bad guys are human too. And, you know, as you and I are talking, we're just returning now from an interview with an interrogator, an Israeli interrogator who's been interviewing the Hamas gunmen who were captured in southern Israel on October 7th, trying to get information from them. And in the conversation that he and I had, actually, I thought that we saw the world quite differently. And I asked him, you know, were you interested in in trying to understand why these people do what they do? I mean, they're humans and they do what they do for a reason, even if we both disagree with it. And he didn't, and, and maybe it was his background, his, his work, but he didn't want to humanize them at all. He didn't want to admit that they were human. He just said that they're monsters and that he wouldn't even describe them as human. And as an objective journalist, I actually think that that is detrimental to our efforts in understanding people involved in conflict. Because I think you can objectively disagree with actions that people take, but still have a desire to understand why they take them. And I think that that's a lot of our role is understanding that. And so you do see the the worst of humanity and and you do see the the most horrific parts of this world as well. And and you know this very well, I've been reported across the Middle East, but I'm often fascinated in in that understanding of why people do what they do. And I think back to coverage in Afghanistan, for example, after the Taliban took over and talking to these Taliban fighters who spent most of their lives in the mountains and fighting American forces that are just about my age now and trying to understand them. It's all that they knew. They thought that they were doing the right thing. And, you know, as an American citizen, that's, hard to process because it was my fellow countrymen who were dying as a result of their IED attacks and the battles that they were conducting against U.S. forces in Afghanistan. But I'm still interested in in trying to understand that. And actually, I left those conversations back in in 2021 and, and 2022 with a better understanding of why these people do what they do. And, and actually, I... I understood them in many ways. Yeah. 
I mean, I suppose it's the big difference between when you're trying to defeat, say, a, you know, a, a terror group. Are you just trying to defeat and kill all their members or are you trying to defeat their ideology? And I think, you know, you have to go into conflict with both in mind. Um, one is, is not enough without the other. Do you think that that at the moment what is happening in Gaza is considering both of those defeating the ideology of Hamas as well as just wiping off the, the terrorists and the fighters themselves? I don't. And I think that the Israeli approach is quite short-sighted. And that, that's been controversial. And I that's not really an opinion. That's a, a fact. The fact on the ground is that the Israelis don't have a clear plan for the day after in Gaza. And they're also approaching this entire conflict with a goal that is not obtainable, a, a goal of destroying Hamas as an organization. And that goal has always left out the fact that Hamas can't be destroyed because it's based on an ideology. I mean, it's, it's like trying to destroy ISIS. Yes, you can greatly reduce the capabilities of the organization, but it'll still continue to operate in different capacities. And I think the Israelis have that problem inside Gaza. I wonder if the main goal is really just to say it's a warning for any future attacks. You know, we may not wipe out your ideology, but we will set you back 20 years. We'll destroy everything you've got, and then we'll do it again in 20 years. You know, it, it, it's at your peril to keep attacking us. And I think that perhaps it is, that's the, as far as the Israeli battle against ideology goes. It is just a stern warning. We'll just knock you down again and again, and there's no way you can conquer us. Absolutely. And I think that when we look at the Israeli perspective to this this war, they do have initial goals on the ground. And those goals include basically allowing people in the South and the North to return to their homes in the aftermath of what was the largest attack against the state of Israel in the country's history. I think the challenging part is, is where does the region go from here? Because it's one thing to win. And, and I don't think that there really are any winners in war, but one thing to finish the objectives of, of the war to not totally demilitarize Gaza, but reduce the organizations there from having the capability to fire rockets and launch cross-border attacks. And once they do that, the question is what comes next? And, and also as a society here, how do they move forward? How do they heal? Because mm -hmm. this is the thing that I think that people miss, that they just don't grasp about what's happening on the ground in the Middle East right now. They don't understand that two things can be true at once. That the October 7th massacre was the largest slaughter of Jews since the Holocaust. It deeply traumatized this population, but also the Jewish diaspora around the world. But the Israeli response to that massacre has led to the highest death toll among Palestinian civilians in the history of their people. And has also traumatized the psyche of Palestinians and the Palestinian diaspora around the world. And so there's a lot of distrust. There's a lot of hatred. And there is a lot of finger pointing of people grasping for their trauma to be considered valid. And I think that that is part of our role as journalists to ensure that we are covering all sides of this conflict and that we're humanizing the people involved. Because, again, it goes back to what we talked about before, people doing what they do for a reason. And you don't always have to objectively agree with that reason or, or think that it's logical. But the circumstances that people are operating under here are quite different. The history is, is quite different. And the context is important when we talk about how we got here today. I wonder if you, you want to have your own opinions. And I know that those don't appear in any of your reports. That's, you know, the, the best thing about all the work you do. But how do you put those to the side? Say you're going in to do a story. Say you are interviewing, you know, if you interview the Taliban and Hamas and you can, as we said a moment ago, you know, you can try and understand them, but you obviously have a feeling about what they're doing. But personally, how do you put to the side? Do you, do you talk to yourself before you go out? You know, I've heard you say in the past, you have to sort of be the, the calm in the center of the storm. Like, how do you personally prepare to go and tell those stories and, and, and get yourself in the right mind frame? I would say that my approach is... It's quite simple, actually. It's just trying to remember each and every day what I'm here to do. And that's to tell the stories of other people in a way that makes our audience care about this region. And also 
makes them come away from the report that they're watching or the book that they're reading or the story that they see online with a better understanding of the people involved. And so, you know, it, it's hard. And I think it's hard from the perspective of when you see really horrific things like we saw on the morning of October 7th or the horrific things that we saw inside Gaza and the destruction of Palestinian communities and oftentimes the dehumanization of both sides in the conflict. That can be challenging to stay clear headed amidst. And it, and it also can be challenging to approach from an objective angle. But I think that, you know, you and I share this in the sense that we do feel a massive responsibility to tell these stories through an objective lens because we care about the craft and we understand the role of the craft, which is making sure that people can grasp the complexities of a conflict like the one that we're covering today. And so personally, my preparation is quite simple. It's just remembering what I'm here to do and also remembering that two things can be true at once. Mm -hmm. And so I always sort of question myself and I, and I always, when I do a report, I try to play devil's advocate with myself and say, okay, well, what did you miss here? What would someone who maybe doesn't see things the way that the person you interviewed sees them, what would they think? And how can we include their perspective so that we get closer to reality? Because that's the goal here. The goal here is to get as close to the on the ground truth as possible. And that's what we aim to do every day. I'd say that your the way that you cover stories has changed a bit if you go back a few years. And I feel that you sort of, you use the word yourself quite often, focused. Is that something that you have worked at, that you have sort of tried not to be as much a part of the action around you and really try to maintain this sort of very focused middle ground kind of coverage? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that stems from getting a little bit older and just being in the industry a little bit longer. I also think it stems from experiencing war firsthand. And, you know, well, a lot of the images that we saw in Ukraine, a lot of the images that we saw here, a lot of the stories that we covered in real time, they change you as a person. And I think they also remind you what's important in this coverage. Mm. And I think we know what's important. It's the people, it's the subjects, the people that we interview. And I, I would just say that as I've gotten a little bit older, I'm less distracted by the, the gunfire, I'm less distracted by the explosions. And I'm more focused on telling those stories that I think are the, the focal point of our coverage and, and at least should be. Yeah. Yeah. I remember well, well, 15, 20 years ago when I started the first few stories, all you wanted was a bit of gunfire in the background. You thought that was the story. And boy, did you learn quickly that that was just such a minor part of the story. But do remember at the beginning, that's what kind of what I thought covering conflict was about. It was about showing the action. Uh, and that is an important part of it. But like, boy, does that, does that start to change? Um, I mean, do you find ways then of really in, enjoying it? And we, you talked a lot about you know, the responsibility of telling these stories. You talked a lot about how important it is to find the right narrative. But you must love it. I mean, yeah, I mean, you must love what you're doing or you wouldn't be doing it. So how can you hold those two things side by side, absolutely passionate and love what you're doing and presumably find it pretty exciting too, but also having this very serious sort of, um, you know, element of, of reporting? Um, to, so the short answer is I love what I do. And I find the job to be incredibly rewarding because you can see in real time the impact that you're having. And that's the luxury that we have. And it truly is a luxury to be able to go places that other people won't go and tell stories that otherwise wouldn't be told. But we also have the luxury to be able to leave. And that's something that so many of our subjects that we interviewed don't have. But I find a lot of, of joy in this work and, and passion. And it's something that I think you have to have as a war correspondent, you have to have, because if you don't, this would be all too consuming. The horrific 
scenes that we see, the the days that we are there so often for the worst days of, of people's lives. And I think that if you didn't love it and you didn't find some sense of joy in it, in, in the storytelling and, and purpose, and I think purpose is the real word to focus on here, because if you didn't have that purpose, this job would, would be, it wouldn't be very fun. It, mm-hmm. it wouldn't be something that you want to look forward to every day. And it doesn't mean that what we see or what we experience is is positive. Oftentimes it's very negative, but I think there's something to learn in that negativity. And I think that if we can find, if we can find the things that we learn about ourselves and about our whole experience here during the coverage, you, you take something home with you. And I think that there are few of us that have experienced this side of the industry as journalists, but the people who go out and gather these stories and stand alongside the people who are having the worst days of their lives and listen, really like truly listen to them. It's so cathartic for people to be able to speak with journalists. And I'm sure you've experienced this, but there are so many times where I know that I have the soundbite that I need for my piece. I know that I have all the information for my story, but yet I let the people continue talking because you can just feel that they they want to get it out. They want to talk to someone. And it's a privilege to be able to to listen to those stories and then bring them to our audience because we play that important role to humanize these conflicts and make people care about them. Because if we weren't there, and there are many places that we're not, and that other journalists aren't either. And oftentimes those conflicts slip under the radar and people don't know about them. And that's just why it's so important that this industry continues to thrive and that the resources are there for journalists in the field so they can keep doing this work. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think you can only get, get through it and become good at it by understanding that you can, that you improve, you become stronger from everything you see. It makes you a better, stronger person. Um, and I guess in, in some senses, it's a great gift to be given that. Um, and I think if you don't do that, then I think it probably tear you apart. But with that comes an understanding that, you can't switch it on and off. You, you, you have, you know, for your lifetime, you've committed to this and learning things which you might otherwise not have seen. And so do you think that you are, you've made that decision in life that this is going to be, you know, this is what you want to do. And I, I wonder where that takes you in the future. I mean, like you can't just pull back from, from something like this easily. It has changed you as a person. Yeah, definitely. But it's, it's interesting. You know, you and I have had this conversation so many times offline before, but you know, I've always looked up to you and your ability to do this work, but also maintain a beautiful family and have that personal life. And I think that's the thing that I aspire to. And it's a thing that I hope to have for myself one day, because there is a sense of wanting to also be able to develop personally as a human. You know, professionally, we're in the field, we're out there, we're leading international coverage, and we're we're lucky to have the platform to tell these stories on, but there is a a sense of, of loneliness that comes with the job. There is a sense of feeling overwhelmed sometimes just by the, it's not a burden, but it's a, it's a responsibility to make sure that the world knows what's happening to so many people. And I never feel like I'm doing enough. And I know that that's a personal problem, but it's, it's an artifact of, being around so many people who are suffering all the time and wanting to scream at the top of your lungs to the rest of the world, what's happening to them and feeling like, yeah, people will watch your report or they'll see your post on X and then they'll go back to their lives. And it reminds me of this line from the movie Hotel Rwanda, where two of the main characters are talking about how people will look up and they will see what's happening in Rwanda in the nineties. And they will say, that is so horrible. I can't believe that. And then they'll go back to eating dinner. And I always tell people like, my goal is to not have people fly across the world and come here and try to help out in some way. I I feel that I have succeeded if people go back to having dinner and they have a conversation about what we're reporting on. But to get back to your initial question, I think that it would be nice one day to have a family to have dinner with and to be able to 
talk about these things and to educate the next generation about what's happening in the world. And I think that it, you've got to find that balance, but that can be hard. And especially with some of the things that we see and experience, um, it does raise questions about how you separate that in your mind. And my hope, like with my change in coverage as, I, as I've grown, how, how your coverage grows, I hope that my personal life grows as well and, and that I find ways to navigate those complexities because it can be quite consuming to be around this all the time. Yeah. I mean, you say that, you know, uh, you saw how I was how I had a family and was able to do the coverage, but as soon as I went to the State Department and having agreed with Alicia, my wife, that I was going to pull back from covering conflict, I, I couldn't, I still couldn't stop. And Ukraine happened, and the first thing I had to do was get out there. And it happens every time I see something on the news now. It is in you forever. I mean, I, I, I don't find many other stories to be, to feel quite as important as the stories we told out there. And so I, I've decided that it is something there is with me forever, and this is something that you have to embrace. But do, do you look forward? Do you see that this is a window right now, that this conflict or next conflict, or do you not – not drawing any sort of time level scale on it. I don't know. Cause I, you know, I think back, you raise a good point. And this is the most interesting conversation that I've had about this because it's, you know, you understand this in a way that not a lot of other people do, but I think back to that time period when the Russian invasion of Ukraine started and you and I had made a decision that we were going to stay there no matter what, because that's where the story was. And we were at different points in our lives then in different places, but yet we still have the same desire to be there, to tell the story, to watch history unfold. And so I think you're right in that, in that way. I don't know that I'll ever lose that desire, but I would say there's two, two thoughts that I have in my mind. One is, is burnout, just working too much on one story um, and not separating enough from the story, even when I have a day off. And the second is, trying to place myself five years, 10 years out from now and understanding the impact of this every day on the mind. Because in the short term, it's challenging to really grasp just how much it affects you. And I don't notice it personally until I go back to reality. And just that description itself maybe tells you a little bit about the work, but until I go back to reality and I think back to, I went to a wedding earlier this year some of my friends from Israel were getting married in the United States. They had just moved there. And I just remember flying to this wedding in the Catskill Mountains in New York. And it was great to disconnect, but also I had to like retrain myself to talk to people about normal things. And I felt like a robot as I was talking to people at this wedding and asking, yeah, so what, what team's playing this weekend? And yeah, then I'm yeah. thinking to myself, that's a weird question, Trey, you know, yeah. and just ha having to, having to sort of reintegrate. And so that's one other part of it. Yeah. There was a, um, I remember coming home years ago and I'd come in and out of the Middle East and I'd come back to London and a couple of times someone would throw a party because I was coming back. And I remember I'd go into this party and everyone would be there. Uh, and I'd leave 10 minutes later. I couldn't, I didn't, what, what, what am I going to say? Hey, how's it going? How are you doing? And, and I couldn't, couldn't do it either. And I remember just really quietly leaving and finding somewhere else. I mean, do you, do you think to yourself sometimes at the end of a big day, end of a big week, I mean, it's all tough out there, but do, do, you, do you stop and try and think about what you're mentally, what you've seen, or just try and put in perspective? Or, or you're, I know you talk to your team about it as well. Like, I'm sure there are a number of ways in which you might approach that, or do you just say, I'll deal with it at a later date and put it to one side? You know, I kept saying, I'll deal with it at a later date. I'll deal with it at a later date, but it is cumulative. Hmm. And that was something that I learned that it's not like if you don't process it in real time, that it just disappears. It's like, you, you've got to sort of think through it or it'll hit you at random times. And I think that I'm probably not the best example of someone who has taken the time to process it. Cause I still feel in the middle of the story, I will say like personally over the next six months, one of my goals is to go on a proper vacation and disconnect from this and maybe start to think through some of it. But I will say that understanding that I am acutely aware of the people that came before me in the industry and how they handled being war correspondents. And I think that a lot of it was really unhealthy devoting life to drugs and alcohol and trying to escape it. So I'm not trying to escape it. I'm just sort of putting it off. 
And while I'm putting it off, I'm focusing on eating healthy and going to the gym and taking cold showers and talking about mental health in a way that I hope will set a new standard in the industry and a new image that you can be tough and you can be a hardened war correspondent and also not throw your life away. Yeah. And I think your book, Black Saturday, um, really lays that out really well, actually. And I'm sure just in writing it as well, I always found writing to be a really good way of actually sitting down and getting your thoughts out and your feelings out, which I wasn't able to do quite as well just in, in passing conversations. So uh, do you find that the book helped with that? Were you able for one point to sit down and think and write it and get some of it out that way? Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, you, you know, the process was saved, you know, it was uh, one of those things that you start and then it's, it feels like you're running a marathon mm. because you just have to go a little bit at a time and you can't see the finish line, but you know, it's eventually going to be there. But it was interesting to be able to reflect on some of these moments afterwards, especially on these pieces of coverage that I think were quite consequential in the world's understanding of what happened in the Middle East in early October of last year. And so, you know, going back there in a way, it transports you. And for me, I think it helped to process what we saw a little bit, but I've also heard from people who have read the book and told me that they thought it was really powerful. It was incredibly informative, but they couldn't read it all at once. Like I've had a lot of people tell me they needed to read a chapter and then go outside and take a walk and mm -hmm. clear the mind. And I don't know that while I was writing it or even afterwards, I realized how much of an impact it would have on people. And that has made me start to think about how numb I've become to some of it, because I don't have that experience when I read it. It's interesting and informative and quite sad in many ways, but I don't, feel overwhelmed reading it. And, and people have told me that they do. And I understand that because a lot of what we saw and, and what we gathered in the course of our reporting was really, really heavy stuff. But I do think that it speaks to, you know, a, a reality of the situation and, and how you perceive things after living through them versus reading about them. Yeah, I, f I feel exactly the same way too. You know, I go and do pick the, my girls up from school sometimes. And um, there are things that I think I just mentioned them because they're I think they're, they're sort of normal. And like the whole parent group just goes into total meltdown. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, it was just this thing I was doing the other day, you know? And I realized what on a different page I am to so many people. Or well, things that I won't say because I don't even think they're a big deal. But then you mention them to one person and everyone's absolutely horrified about it. But you didn't, I didn't realize that, you know? It felt totally normal to me. More of our conversation right after this. Do you ever think, because I certainly used to think, even before Ukraine, I would think, what how I would react, what I would be like if I was injured, you know, would I have the strength I'd seen in other people? Like, do you ever ask yourself those sort of theoretical questions? Yeah, um, because I think there's an inherent risk to what we do. And I think it goes back to what we talked about at the beginning of this conversation, which is you have to really love it and be passionate about it and understand those risks and in some ways accept them because there are just many situations, and I found this in our reporting here in the course of our coverage of this war, that you can take precautions and just these are unpredictable environments that we're operating in. And, yeah, I've thought through that. I try not to let it cloud my judgment at all because I think that that makes the situations more dangerous. But even in the course of our reporting in, in Gaza, I mean, there were times where I was actually really afraid and – you know, I'm someone who has solo skydived and, you know, I'm really interested in adventure and uh, I'm not afraid of a whole lot of things, but I, I don't know if it's getting older or just the intensity of the war or just consuming the amount of, of videos that you consume when you, you look at wars that are unfolding now in the modern era. But uh, there were times where I was really afraid, like really afraid. And I was like making deals with myself in my head. And I, I write about this in Black Saturday a little bit, but I was making deals with myself. Okay, this is the last embed I'm going to do. If I survive this, like it's the last one I'm going to do. And then, well, a week later, I'm back inside. But that's yeah. just who we are. <laughs> it's what we do, you know? You know, courage is not about 
a lack of fear. It's about being able to continue doing what you're doing despite the fear. And I think that's a, a slight difference. Yeah. Um, is there anything you wish you hadn't done? You know, if you look back, is there any, any mistakes you wish you had made? I think early in my career, like real early when I was 20, 21, I think I was pretty reckless. I, I put myself in a lot of situations that were incredibly dangerous and just by chance I, I wasn't injured or killed. Um, and so I, I think in hindsight, I, I would have done those things differently. Yeah. You know, I, I learned a lot as a result. And it's a really tough one because, I mean, I remember, you know, also, you know, as a freelancer, there were two options. You either went somewhere no one else had gone and you got published and you sold your story or you didn't and you didn't get published. And, you know, I was going to ask at one point, what would your advice be to anyone who wants to become a war correspondent? But it's a difficult one because I, I would tell everyone, don't run off and do anything stupid. But at the same time, you know, how are you going to tell those stories? How are you going to get places and be noticed if you don't? go and do something no one else has done. It's a really tough way to start off as a war correspondent. You know, how do you begin? So again, what, what, what would your advice be? Like if someone is listening and you know, they, they think they, they'd love to do it, they believe in reporting and coverage and news and telling the stories of conflict and humanity, what should they do? How should they do it? Should they do it? That's tough. <laughs> um, I, I agree with you. Like that's the, you know, and it's a, it's a catch 22 because that's, you know, how you and I stood out. We were doing the things that other people wouldn't do, but looking back, it's, uh, it, it's a miracle that, that it wasn't worse during that time. Cause there were just times, I mean, there were just countless times where I remember being 20 years old and my college roommate had signed the letter that I needed from the government press office, you know, after he printed it out in our dorm room. And, you know, we, we just, I, I remember coming to the, this is a little like deep in the weeds, but like I remember coming to the Middle East with a plate carrier that was camo that I had duct taped the word press on. <laughs> and I got here and this freelancer that I met was like, you can't go into Gaza with that. And so I found a guy on Facebook and he sold me his flak jacket. And I went to this like settlement on the outskirts of Jerusalem and bought it from the guy for like $300 out of the back of his car. And then <laughs> I just like went with these guys toward Gaza and we, ended up on a bus going into the Gaza Strip during the war and there were airstrikes and rockets and all this and, and shelling and shrapnel was hitting the side of the building next to us. And I was just in the middle of it. And I remember like we didn't sell, I don't think we sold any video from when I was actually inside Gaza and we'd post it to YouTube and it would get like a couple hundred views. Like I wasn't making money at that point on that story, but the risk reward at that point. I just, I just wanted to be there. And I, yeah. it's interesting because I still feel the same way. I have a lot more resources and a lot more influence now, but I still just want to be there. Like, and, and, and people think we're crazy. Like people really, even my friends in the industry who are also war correspondents, like guys like you and I, who started out that way, who just wanted it, like they, they can't compute in their minds why we still want to just go go and get the story and it's just it's something inside of you but to answer your initial question of of what advice i would give to someone who wants to be a war correspondent i would say two things i would say if you have that inside of you be as safe as you can and just follow your your gut like just work toward it um there are plenty of war correspondents that aren't maybe that <laughs> insanely focused on having to be there all the time and just consumed by the job and are still quite successful. So you don't need that. And I don't think that's something you can really teach. It's just something inherent in us. But the second piece of advice I have, and I think this is the most important piece of advice and it's what I tell students all the time is to work really, really hard. And it sounds cliche, but every time that I talk to college students or, or any students or, or even younger people in the industry who want to do what we do, because it is kind of like, it's romantic to people in many ways. Like they're very interested in being a foreign correspondent and traveling the world and, and, and learning about people and, and being there when history unfolds, but they don't realize the amount of work that goes in behind the scenes. And, and so I always ask people the same question. I say, first, I want you to think in your mind what your dream job is. It doesn't even have to be a war correspondent, but I want you to think in the industry, what's your dream job? What's the beat that you want? How do you envision yourself 10 years from now when you're at the peak of your career? What are you doing? And I tell them to think about that. And then I tell them, okay, when's your day off? Or when, when are you out of class on, on Saturday, let's say? What are you doing on Saturday? 
And I want you to think of those two things. And if the answer to your second question was not, I'm working on that dream and I'm starting to build that even on my days off, then you're not going to make it. You're, you're just not because you're competing with people like me and like you yeah. mm-hmm. who are working seven days a week toward the dream. And so my advice to them is if you really want it and you feel it in your bones and you're like, this is who I am, this is what I want my identity here on earth to be, put in the time, put in the effort, work on Saturday and Sunday. And if you don't know what to do, do something, take action, write a blog, post a tweet, go out there and practice in your driveway because it's hilarious looking back now. I mean, I look back on there, there's a clip and this is this is it's such an interesting conversation because these are like things you never talk about with people but there's a there's a clip that i have and i'm standing in my driveway less less than 10 years ago and i'm standing in my driveway and i have a dress shirt on and a tie and i have a dslr on, on a tripod and i have this mic that is like hard lined into the camera and i just get in front of the camera and i just this exhale i just sigh i'm like and then I say uh, something to the effect of like tension continues to rise across the Middle East. <laughs> and it's like, I'm just practicing because I want to be a war correspondent one day. I'm just practicing. And you know what? No one watched that clip. And that's so funny. But, I, but that was it, you know, and yeah. you just got to want it. You got to no, want it. That's so funny because I've got exactly the same videos. <laughs> yes. And I used to go out in storms uh, and set it up in storms. So there'd be a bit of action in the background. And I'd like run around and try and do coverage with this like <laughs> thunder and lightning in the background and pretending it was action. Um, but that's because I wanted to figure it out. I'd go and stand out Parliament or Big Ben, whatever. Just me and my camera just kept trying to do it again and again. Uh, and, and I also remember talk about getting body armor, heading into Libya once early and I'd taken a flat jacket, but I hadn't thought I needed a helmet. And of course, we get there and the shells are dropping. Everyone's firing. <laughs> Everyone's looking at me like I'm an idiot. And I remember the only option was to pick it off some some dead Libyan soldier's head who'd fallen. And I, that was at one point I was pretty low. I was like, I'm just going to have to take that guy's helmet because... Either I take his helmet or, or I'm gone. So I was uh, running around with this beaten up old helmet. And um, oh, man. anyway, lesson learned, lesson learned. Yeah. Um, you talk about kids and giving advice for the future. What do you think about future war coverage? And it, I suppose it, it taps into social media and tweets and the videos that everyone's posting up. Like, is what you do for a network now more important because you're trying to you know, differentiate it between all of the noise that's on social media? Yeah, I think that. It has a lot to do with branding. I, my sense of where the industry is headed is that everyone will be an individual brand and that there will still be people working for networks and for media organizations, but the concept that you can brand yourself and and be Benjamin Hall or be Trey Yanks and exist online, I think is going to continue to expand. And when I think about the next generation, I think there's a lot of opportunities, but it requires a degree of focus that I even find hard now because with those opportunities comes a lot of distractions, right? Like you have the ability to now make a 10 minute report on your phone with captions and video that you've sourced from the internet or from people on the ground. But on that same app on Instagram or on TikTok or on X, you also can get sucked into the reels and you can get sucked into the algorithm that is curated specifically for your mind and designed to keep you using the app. And so it requires a degree of clarity and focus that I even find hard myself sometimes. And it's constantly reminding yourself of, am I creating or am I consuming? And I think that's going to become more and more important to think about in the next generation and, and, for the next five to 10 years of the industry. Yeah. Um, I could talk to you for hours, Trey, nonstop. <laughs> um, but I suppose let's just finish up by sort of talking about, I suppose talking what we started off talking about, and it's about sort of resilience and strength. And I suppose what your message would be to people who, maybe let's say your message to people who are going through something that's tricky even back home or, or, you know, something's not going well. And I sort of ask this to all my guests, you know, you've had to get through things that are tricky. You have looked, you know, fear in the eyes and you've managed to get through it. So what would your advice be to people who are finding something difficult and they're looking for a way through something that's tricky? What would you say to them? I have two pieces of advice. And the first one is going to be softer. And the second one is going to be harder. 
And these are pieces of advice I, I give to my friends and I give to myself sometimes. The, and the softer advice is that it's going to be okay. This is temporary and this too shall pass. Mm-hmm. And if you can just keep your head up, think about what it's going to be like when it does pass and try to focus on healthy habits, like eating healthy, getting sunlight, going for walks, staying active, the body and mind, you're going to get through it. And there are a lot of people that care about you and that love you and want to see you succeed and be at peace, not necessarily be happy, but find peace in your existence. That's my soft piece of advice. And I think you should consider that. And I think it's important to remember. And for those that maybe want a little bit more active or a little bit more of a drill sergeant, no one's coming to save you. No one is coming to save you. The only person who can truly help you is you. And you know what you need to do. You know that going to McDonald's and, and, and eating a Big Mac and fries is going to make you feel differently than going to have uh, chicken and broccoli. You know that staying inside watching movies all day is going to make you feel different than going for a walk in the sunlight and getting some fresh air. You know that standing and just scrolling on your phone for hours on end is going to change your focus. And, and it's going to feel a lot different than if you were to read a book for an hour and then have a glass of water. And so the, the point of my second piece of advice is that no one's coming to save you and you have to take your life into your own hands. And at first it's going to be really, really uncomfortable. And at second, it's going to be really, really uncomfortable. And you know what, for weeks, maybe months, but eventually you're going to come out stronger, both mentally and physically. And then you're going to be in the position that I'm in right now, giving advice to other people and telling them how their day and how their life can be better. And that's the goal, I think, to get to a place where you can bring up the people around you. And if you can't right now, it's nothing to be ashamed about, but it will get better. But you have to take your own life into your own hands. Yeah. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. A number of the people I speak to sort of say something similar, which is, you know, 80% community is there to help you. They're there, it's community. But 20% is you. You got to make that move. You got to make it better. You got to stand up and push yourself or it won't happen. So it's got to be both of them. Trey, I, honestly, I'm <laughs> such a joy every time talking to you. I feel we need to do round two of this uh, another time. But I suppose just to say thank you for coming on. Thank you for all the work you do out there. You know, everyone I speak to just just says that without your coverage, we wouldn't have an idea of what was happening on all sides of this conflict. And, you know, you're someone who I totally admire and respect. And uh, to be honest, I wish I was there side by side with you. I still get that feeling every time I turn on the news, every time we get an alert, every time I get an email, it's still in. That message to me is... I wish I was there. I wish I was out there, but you're doing it for everyone, Trey. So thank you. Well, thank you, my friend. And next time we'll do it in person. And I look forward to seeing you soon. It was great to talk to you. Take care, brother. Talk to you soon. See you. You're listening to Searching for Heroes with Benjamin Hall. We'll be right back. It's funny because I don't often speak to people about uh, Ukraine and speak to other people about what it was like for them. And so to speak to Trey about that again is, um, you know, it's two things. It's I think it's important. It's good to talk about it. Good to remember Pierre and Sasha and why we keep doing what we do despite the dangers. Um, but it also opens up so many feelings, which, you know, after Ukraine, you sometimes try and move forward. You try and compartmentalize those. And so, you know, it's always interesting to talk about them again and always interesting to speak to, to Trey about it. So... First and foremost, I will say that um, we always remember Pierre and Sasha. You know, they were incredible people and they died doing something that they both thought was incredibly important and which was incredibly important. And um, I think it is in honor to them every single day that correspondents like Trey continue to tell uh, tell the stories and the news that they do. So um, thank you, everyone, for listening. And um, I'll speak to you next week. Listen ad-free with a Fox News Podcast Plus subscription on Apple Podcasts. And Amazon Prime members can listen to this show ad-free on the Amazon Music app.